morning. Good morning. Welcome to Living Word Reformed Church. Uh, we're here once again to celebrate God's goodness to us. Um, as our, our brother Al prayed in the uh, consistory room before, uh, this is a place where we come each week to be refreshed, to be renewed uh, from all the things that happen around us in this world. Uh, we can come to a place of where God gives us peace and uh, God gives us that grace that we need each and every day. Let's come to him in prayer and ask him uh, for a blessing on us and that we might be a blessing to him. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, uh, another beautiful day that you have given us and another Lord's Day. And Father, we thank you for uh, this day that we can come together uh, as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ and that we can um, worship and praise your name. And Lord, we pray that that may indeed be the case, that our worship to you would be pleasing this morning. And we pray, Lord, that uh, your grace, mercy, and peace would be with us through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in each one of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our call to worship is found in number 112 in the Sing to the Lord. It's a, a responsive reading. Let's read that together. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. Splendor and majesty are before him. Praise and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of nations, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. That's what we've come to do today is to worship our God, and let's do that as we continue our worship by singing, uh, O come let us adore him, and then Lord we praise you. And let's stand as we sing.
Before we're seated, turn around and uh, wave hi to uh, the person behind you or all the way at the other end. Hopefully soon we can uh, do our more normal thing in going around and shaking hands and hugging people. As we come together, we, we read a responsive reading that's entitled, Into His Presence. And, and I, I know that you know, when we come to church, we come into a church building, we, it, it's, uh, we're aware of the fact that we're coming into God's presence. But how often do we think that during the week that we are in God's presence, wherever we are? That whether we're at home, whether we're on the road, whether we're at work, in the office, on the job, wherever it might be, that we are in the presence of God because God lives within each one of us. You know, I think we forget about that a lot. And, and also, I think that we take that for granted, that God is, we are always in the presence of our God. Well, our prayer of confession is about that, that, that we would be aware of that and that, that uh, we would trust in God each and every moment of the day. Let's pray that prayer of confession together. God, you know our hearts. You have knitted our inmost being, and you know our deepest desires, fears, and worries. Help us each day to have a new awareness of your presence in our lives. Save us from our own temptations so that we may more freely follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. In the book of Romans, Paul reminds us in Romans 5, verses 6 through 8, that Christ died for us. And Christ, the fact that Christ died for us means that when we confess our sin, that, that God forgives us. Paul writes here, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God didn't wait for us to clean up our act. God didn't wait for us to make the move to him. God reached out and made the move to us first. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What a great promise. What a great um, story that is, that story of salvation. And we thank God and praise God for his saving grace to us and for his grace to us in each and every moment of our lives. Let's respond to God's grace as we sing, May the Mind of Christ My Savior, verses 1 through three and remain seated as we sing. At this time, I'd like to invite the kids to come forward for a kid's message. I need your help, kids. Come on up, because I, I, I need some advice from you, okay? 
but I have something for you. So that should be, no, Al, you stay there. Come on, Tiffany, let's go. Come on, I'm not going to. Now, we have to practice social distancing. You guys know what that is, right? So David can sit here, all right? And you guys can sit here. And we have a couple of other kids. You, you can sit over here, guys, okay? You can sit over here, Aiden. And maybe you can sit over here, okay? All right? You can, you can sit down, okay? And what's, can I ask what your name is? Elias. Elias. And your name is? Analia. Analia. And this is Tiffany and Aiden and David, okay? Now, I have a problem, and I, I want to get your advice this morning. You see, somebody gave me all these lollipops. You see? They're called blow pops. You know what, you know what they are? You like them? No? Okay, okay. Well, somebody gave me all these, and do you think that I should eat them all? Probably not, right? Probably not good for me to eat them all. So, so what should I do? What, what should I do with them? Help people. Help people, okay. Hand them, okay. So share them with others, right? Okay, very good, Elias. Um, well, let's see. Maybe I could share them with you guys. But why would I want to do that? Why, why you know, they, they were given to me. They're mine. Why wouldn't I want to eat them all myself? Right, the Bible says to share, right? The Bible says that we are to share <clears throat> what God has given us so that others would have something to eat, something to wear, that others would have something too, right? Well, what I want to do this morning is I want to share this with you all, okay? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay these out on the communion table here, and I think I have enough for to, hey, oh, Good, we have, we have another one come up, all right. I think we have enough for, for two. How are you doing this morning? Good? Good. I think we have enough for two for everybody. And what I want you to do, you know, it's one thing for us to say that we should share these, right? That's one thing. But the thing that really we're asked to do is not just talk about that, but we're asked to share them with others, right? And so what I want you to do is before you go back to your seats, come up and take two of them, all right? Each of you take two, but I want you to share one of them with somebody, okay? With a friend, with a relative, a cousin, whatever, okay? If you could share one, okay? And then what we'll be doing is we'll be practicing what God tells us in his word, in the Bible, just like Anna Marie said, right? Anna, 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 we have an Anna Marie in our church, so i getting you mixed up. But just like you said, the Bible tells us to do that. And it doesn't do us any good if, if we take two of these and go back and, and we eat them both, right? But we need to share one, okay? So if you will do that, then you'll be doing exactly what we're going to be looking at this morning from the Bible, that God tells us that we are to share all the good things that he has given us so that others might have what they need. Thanks for coming up this morning. So if you can come up here and take two of them, okay? All right. Remember to, uh, to share them with, share one of them with somebody, okay? And it looks like I still have some. Oh, here we go. Take two of them, all right? There you go. Thank you. All right, I've got four left. Let's see, one for each day here uh, at church. Okay. Thank you, kids. We're going to be looking at God's Word this morning as it's found in 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 15. 2 Corinthians 8 verses 1 through 15. And here Paul talks about giving. Um, and um, 
usually maybe a text like this would be preached when uh, at budget time or whatever. Uh, but this is where we're at in, in 2 Corinthians. We've been going through the chapters, and chapter 8 is about giving, and so that's what we'll be looking at this morning. So 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 15. This is the word of the Lord for us this morning. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial... Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they, were, that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it, according to your means." For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Our desire is not not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality, as it is written. He who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. And that's the word of the Lord for us this morning. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the church in Corinth was on the route that Paul took in his third missionary journey. And one of the major objectives of that third missionary journey was to take a special collection or fund for the poor Christians who lived in Jerusalem. Now, apparently the Corinthian church had made a pledge to do that. Paul refers to that uh, here. He said, last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. But now finish the work. So they had made a pledge, but they didn't finish. They didn't complete their pledge. They didn't make their complete payment. Well, to motivate them, to do that, to finish what they had pledged. Paul appeals to them by saying that giving is an act of grace. He says that in verse 6. In verse 6, he says, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. You might call it gracious giving. In fact, in verse 1, 6, 7, and 8, Paul mentions the word grace or gracious. And when I first read that, I was wondering, now what is gracious giving? What what does Paul mean by that? Well, you know, we've heard gracious used with, we have a gracious God, that he gave himself up for us. Uh, You hear of people being gracious, that person is a gracious person, or or maybe she is a gracious host, or he is a gracious host, or, or maybe... That family was so gracious to us, you know, in, when we came over for dinner or something like that. Gracious manner, gracious wife, gracious life, or gracious living. But gracious giving, what could Paul mean by gracious giving? Well, maybe it would be helpful to look at the definition. Uh, it's defined as, okay, I'll look at it up there, as Marked by kindness, courtesy, 
compassion, and generosity of spirit. Now, a couple of other words that I found um, is merciful, cordial, hospitable, benevolent. And I think of, of all those words, generosity and benevolent, are probably the two that resonate most with us in terms of giving. When you think of maybe gracious giving, we think, well, that must be generous giving. That's what Paul is talking about here. And, and, and yes, generous is a part of gracious giving, but it's not all that gracious giving is. There's much more to it. And Paul talks about that here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. What I'd like to do is to look at three things that Paul talks about as being a part of gracious giving. One is the motive of gracious giving. Second is the measure. And the third is the model. Now, when you look at these, you see that the motive drives the measure, and the measure is based on the model. So let's look at these three, the, the motive, the measure, and the model. Well, what, what might be the motive for gracious giving? Well, Paul starts by giving us the example of the Macedonian church. He, he writes here in verse 2 that they had been going through a severe trial, but that they still gave generously. That in spite of their circumstances, in spite of the fact that they needed money as well or they needed the goods as well, that they still gave and they, and they pleaded actually with Paul to be able to give. Well, this tells us that gracious giving is not necessarily based on our circumstances. Well, I've got a lot of money, so I'm going to be able to give some of it away. I had a whole bunch of lollipops, so I could afford to give some away. That's not what generous giving is. In fact, it reminds me of the story in Mark 12 where Jesus and the disciples are in the temple. And they're watching people put money in the money box. And, and, and Jesus points out that there was a, a widow who puts in two simple copper coins worth less than a couple of cents. And Jesus says that she put in, uh, she gave out of her poverty, whereas the other gave out of their riches. And, and even though some may have given a lot of money, Jesus was saying what she gave was just as important because she gave out of her poverty. She gave out of her heart. And notice too, we mentioned already that it was voluntarily. It was on their own. Paul did not have to uh, coax them into giving. They even pleaded, as we said before. Well, how could this be? You have a young church. They have financial needs. Um, they uh, are are asked to give to the church in Jerusalem. Why would they give? Why would they plead to give? And why would they give generously? Well, they had experienced the grace of God. Paul says in verse 1, And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. They had experienced God's grace, and that motivated them to give. And to give graciously, to give out of their poverty, and also to give willingly, in fact, pleading to give to the church. And when you think about it, we should be motivated to give graciously as well, because we have experienced God's grace in so many areas of our lives. First of all, God's saving grace, that we have experienced the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. We have experienced God's comforting grace. God has comforted us in times of need. We have experienced God's providing grace. He has provided for us many, many times over. His protecting grace, his sanctifying grace, help us to gr helping us to grow in our faith day by day. Every area of, of our lives is impacted by God's grace. There's not one area of our lives that is not impacted by God's grace. And so we certainly have the same motive as that Macedonian church and the Corinthian church to give, to give graciously because of God's grace. But there's another reason why 
we are motivated to gracious giving. And that is because our God is a giving God. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he, what? he gave his only son. In James, James says that if you lack wisdom, ask God and he will give it to you. And listen to some of these verses that talk about how God is a giving God. Matthew 7, verse 11. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Or Psalm 37, verse 4. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Acts 17, verse 25. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. You see, every aspect of our lives are impacted by God's grace. And in Romans 8, verse 32, I love this verse. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things. Our God is not just a giver, but our God is a gracious giver. And we are called to be like him. And so we are called to be gracious givers. Because we have the, uh, we have the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we uh, experience every day. And we have a God who is a giving God. But one other thing, in addition to his grace and his giving, we also have his blessing. In Acts 20, verse 35, Paul reminds us that Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. In Proverbs 11, verse 25, uh, we read, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. And Malachi 3, verse 10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Our God is a God of grace. He's a giving God. And he blesses us when we bless him and when we bless others. And I think it could all boil that down to our motivation for gracious giving is God, his grace, his blessing is giving to us. And when you and I consider who God is and what he has done for us, how can we not be gracious givers? Well, that's the motive. The next thing to look at is the measure. Remember that the motive drives the measure. Now, when, when I think of measure, I think of numbers. I think of filling something up and how much does it need to fill. And the Bible talks about tithing. Tithing is 10%. And the Bible talks about that in a number of places. The first time we read about tithing is when Abraham had defeated the kings that were going to attack Sodom and Gomorrah. And of course, his nephew lived there. Uh, well, he defeated those kings. And on his way back, he stopped in Salem and uh, gave 10% of all that he had to Melchizedek, the king of Salem and also the high priest there. And then we read about uh, the laws that Moses gave Israel, and they talk about tithing. But they talk about more than just a tithe. Listen to what Deuteronomy 12, verse 11 says. Then to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name, there you, will, you are to bring everything I command you, your burnt offerings and sacrifices, your tithes and special gifts, and all the choice possessions you have vowed to the Lord. He doesn't just talk about tithes, but special offerings, your choice possessions, that God was asking them to give what they could to him. And in fact... You read through Deuteronomy, the law requires three types of tithes. One is, you might say, an ongoing tithe, and that was 10% of their income, whether it be money or grain or oil or, uh, or wine, and uh, that was to be given to the Levites. So there's 10% to the church. 
Then there was another 10% that they were to put away, uh, kind of like a layaway plan, for when they go to Jerusalem several times a year. So that it would be food that they would be able to take with them to celebrate in God's presence. So there was a tithe for themselves, uh, themselves, so to speak. And then the third was every three years they were to, to set aside 10% for widows and widowers and orphans and uh, foreigners who were in their, their land. So there was a, a tithe for the community. And um, if you count those up, somebody has said, well, that actually amounts to 23%, 10%, 10%, and one-third every year, 23%. Now, does that mean that, we're, that the number really is 23 and not 10? Well, I, I don't think that Paul uh, or the Bible says that we are to get, to get hung up in numbers. Uh, in fact, Paul doesn't give a number here when he talks about the giving for the Corinthian church. But he, what he does say in verse 7, he says, But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see also that you excel in the grace of giving. In other words, we are to give what we can. Excel means to do the best that you can. We are to give what we can to the Lord. In fact, we see here that the Macedonian church, that they gave graciously and that they gave as much as they were able. In fact, even beyond their ability. You might call it sacrificial giving or even radical giving. If you said to somebody today and they ask you, well, how much do you give to the church? Or how much do you give uh, of, your, of your annual income to charities and, to, the, and to, to missions and things like that? And you said 23%, wow, they, they would think you were crazy. But that's not what Paul is talking about here. In fact, if we consider the motive, the fact that God gave his all for us, then the measure becomes very easy for us, that we want to give as much as we can. And, you know, tithing was put into place so that the people would trust God and not trust their money or trust their possessions, but they would put their trust in God that God would provide for them. And when we give graciously, we are saying to God that I trust you, Lord. I trust that you are going to provide what I need. But when we talk about measure of giving for gracious giving, it's not just a number. It's not just quantity, but it's also quality. In the Old Testament, the people were called to give their best to the Lord, their first fruits. But also, if they were to give a lamb, it was supposed to be a lamb without blemish. It wasn't a situation like, well, you know, I've, I've got a hundred lambs out there and one of them's got a broken leg and he really doesn't do me any good, so um, I'll give that to the Lord. No, that's not gracious giving. They were supposed to give their best, not the leftovers, but their best. It reminds me of the story of Cain and Abel, where Abel gave the choicest, of the flock that he had. And, and, and we see that it was from his heart. And that's what gracious giving is as well. It's from our hearts. Give the best of whatever we give to God, whether it's our money, whether it's our talent, whether it's our time. We are to give the best to God. So generous giving is not just how much you give, or I mean gracious giving. It's not just how much you give. It's not just being generous. That's part of it. But it's giving as much as you can and giving your best. And the key here is excel in the grace of giving. Well, we look at the, the motive and the measure. Finally, the model. And again, the motive drives the measure and the measure is based on the model. And we, we read in verses 8 and 9 that our model is Jesus Christ. Paul says, I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. 
For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Now Paul's not talking there about material wealth. He's talking about spiritual riches, that we have become rich spiritually because of Jesus Christ. And Jesus did not give out of his riches, but he gave up his riches. He gave up the glory of heaven in order that he might come to give his life for us. He was all powerful, but he set his power aside so that he could die for us. He gave his very life, not just 10% or some arbitrary number, but Jesus gave his all. Somebody put it this way, that when Jesus suffered for us, that he was scourged by the Roman soldiers. And that meant that he was beat on his back and the back of his legs with uh, Roman cat of nine tails. And maybe it looks something like this, but the important thing is that tied to those ropes that would lash him was pieces of metal or sharp bone or something like that that would not just whip him, but would cut open his flesh. And one commentator said that, aren't you glad that he didn't stop at four, which would be about 10%, but he went all the way for us. Or consider the fact that he hung on that cross for six hours from nine o'clock in the morning till three o'clock in the afternoon. And again, this commentator said, aren't you glad that after 10% or 10% of six hours would be 36 minutes? that after 36 minutes, he didn't call down 10,000 angels and say, get me off of this cross and destroy the Romans. No, he stayed there the whole time. He gave his all for us. Well, Jesus not only gave his all, but he did it willingly. It, 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 was, it was all according to his will that he graciously gave himself up. For us, and we are to give our all and our best. Now, does that mean that we have to sell everything and, and give it all to the poor? That's not what Paul is talking about here. Uh, in fact, Paul knows and God knows that we need money, that we need resources to support our families, that we need that to live. No, what, what Paul is talking about, what the Bible is talking about, is that God has given us so much that everything we have is from God and that everything that we have is God's. God has given it to us, whether it's our, our, our every breath that we take, whether it's our money, whether it's our homes, whatever it might be, he's given those things to us to use for his glory. And so all those things uh, are, should be available to him to use. Now, will he ask us to give everything? Maybe he might. He might ask you to sell everything and give to the poor. But the important thing is that what we have is God's and it should be available for him or to him for his service to help build his kingdom. Well, how do we sum this up? Well, I think the key words are found in verse 7. We mentioned them before that we are to excel in everything, and that includes giving, that we are to ex in excel in gracious giving. And that's a challenge. That is a challenge for each and every one of us. But as we have seen that God's grace touches us in every area of our lives, including, and most importantly, our spiritual lives, that we are to share the grace that God has given to us. Peter writes that, about that in 1 Peter 4, verse 10. He says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. You see, we are not supposed to hoard God's grace, but we're supposed to share God's grace, and that's part of gracious giving. Two weeks ago, we looked at 2 Corinthians 7, and, and that talked about being encouraged and being encouragers. And 
we said that Living Word Church here is an encouraging church, that you all encourage each other in so many ways. And, and we, we said that just like Paul said to the Thess Thessalonian church, that continue in doing that, that you are encouragers and continue it. I think the same is true about gracious giving with Living Word Church. I've seen in, in the three years that I've been here, I've seen gracious giving in several ways. For instance, last year, uh, at the end of the year, the missions budget was running short. And then all of a sudden, we have a tremendous surplus. And, and a surplus that helped us come into the new year, and it's helping us through the new year. But it's not just money. I see brothers and sisters here helping out their brothers and sisters in Christ. I see people helping people when they are in need, when maybe they needed something done in their home. Maybe they needed uh, extra, uh, extra resources, extra finances. I've seen gracious giving here at Living Word Church. And I think God or Paul would say, keep on doing it. Keep on excelling in gracious giving. I mentioned before about our God being a gracious God, gracious giver. And I came across a story. I'm not sure if I shared this over the last three years, um, but even if I did, it, it, it fits perfectly here this morning. You know, God is a gracious giver, and we are called to be like God. This is a story about a soldier at the end of World War II. Shortly after World War II came to a close, Europe began picking up the pieces. Much of the old country had been ravaged by war and was in ruins. Perhaps the saddest sight of all was that of little orphan children starving in the streets of those war-torn cities. Early one chilly morning, on, an American soldier was making his way back to the barracks in London. As he turned the corner in his jeep, he spotted a little lad with his nose pressed to the window of a pastry shop. Inside, the cook was kneading dough for a fresh batch of donuts. The hungry boy stared in silence, watching every move. The soldier pulled his jeep to the curb, stopped, got out, and walked quietly over to where the little fellow was standing. Through the steamed up window, he could see the mouth-watering morsels as they were being pulled from the oven, piping hot. The boy salivated and released a slight groan as he watched the cook place them onto the glass and closed counter ever so carefully. The soldier's heart went out to the nameless orphan as he stood beside him. Son, would you like some of those? The boy was startled. Oh, yeah, I would. The American stepped inside and bought a dozen, put them in a bag, and walked back to where he, the lad was standing in the foggy cold of the London morning. He smiled, held out the bag, and simply said, here you are. As he turned to walk away, he felt a tug on his coat. He looked back and heard the child ask quietly, mister, are you God? We are never more like God than when we give. God so loved the world that he gave. So let's recap. What is gracious giving? It's giving out of our love and thankfulness to God for what he has given to us. It's giving in spite of our circumstances, giving generously and giving our best. And it's giving as the Lord gave us. And that's what gracious giving is all about. Amen. At this time, we come before God in our morning prayer. Let's, let's go to him in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, you are indeed a gracious God. For you not only created us, but, but even when we rebelled against you, that you reached out and you saved us by giving yourself in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his all, 
not just some percentage, but who gave his all for us. Oh God, we, we can hardly imagine. And we sing, Lord, amazing grace, and it, it certainly is amazing that your grace is, is so deep, so wide, so extensive. Lord, as we said, that your grace touches every area of our lives. Every breath that we take is from your gracious hand. And Father, may we respond to your grace by gracious giving. Lord, thank you for the brothers and sisters here at Living Word and for the way that they graciously give to you and and to each other and to those around us as well. Lord, to missionaries, to New Hope, to Bethany, to Lighthouse. Lord, there's so many ways that we give. Lord, help us to continue to excel in gracious giving. Father, we thank you especially for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that our sins are forgiven because of his shed blood. We thank you that that you have protected us from the evil one until the day that Jesus returns. We thank you that you have sealed us with the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit lives within us, uh, comforting us, guiding us, teaching us. We thank you, Father, for all the spiritual blessings that are ours in Christ. And Father, may we share those blessings with others. Lord, may we not only be gracious in giving of our resources, but may we be gracious in giving of our faith and sharing our faith and sharing the story of salvation, sharing our stories with those who we come in contact with. Lord, as we said before, how can we not practice gracious giving when we think of who you are and what you have done for us? Father, we thank you for uh, the way that you have shown your grace to us as a congregation. Lord, we think of how lives have been changed. We think of how um, people have been healed. And Father, we pray that you would continue to pour out your grace upon those who are uh, in special needs. Father, we think of uh, John and we think of Nancy and we think of Marlo and Ken. We think, Lord, of, of those of our congregation who are, are shut in. Uh, think of Jeanette Prummel and, um, and of, of uh, Marie Heatley and um, of uh, Mrs. Tao and Mrs. Egety. And, and now, Lord, we, uh, we think of, of uh, Joe Coster and, and uh, Jerry Veenstra in the Holland Home that, that they are back into... Uh, uh, being at the Holland home and not being able to get out. Lord, we pray for all these people that that you would uh, be with them and that they would experience your grace and your presence just as we began this service by talking about being in your presence. Lord, we pray that they may feel your presence in a real way each and every day. Father, we pray for Chris Fantuzo and his family. Father, as they are beginning to uh, clean things out of their house and looking to sell their home. Lord, we, we pray that you would be with them. And, uh, and Lord, we pray that uh, in all the things that need to be done uh, for them to come, Lord, we pray for a, a smooth transition. And, uh, and Father, we, we just thank you and praise you once again for uh, sending Chris to us. Father, we pray that you would be with our world. Lord, if if, if there ever was a time when we need your grace, Lord, it's now. Father, we pray for peace in our cities. We pray for, uh, we pray, Lord, for wisdom for our leaders. We pray, Lord, that, that we pray for cooperation amongst our leaders. Father, we pray that, that this nation would turn their eyes to you and that they would look to see that, that the only one that really matters is Jesus. And Jesus is the one who can 
save us, is the one who can pull us out of the dark times that we are in. So, Lord, we pray that your word would go forth with power throughout this country. On a day like today, Lord, we pray that uh, your word would go out with power and that people would be saved and would be changed. Father, we pray that uh, you would uh, be with us in the coming week. Lord, we, we need you every day, and we pray that you would indeed be with us, that you would bless us, that you would provide for us, and that we would be willing servants of you wherever you place us, that we would seek to honor you and please you, and that we would seek to do your will. Father, please go with us throughout this uh, week. We thank you, Father, for being with us here this morning. We look forward to your presence in every moment of the day. Lord Jesus, we thank you, and Holy Spirit, we thank you. And we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let's respond to God's word as we sing number 455. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. We'll sing stanzas 1, 2, 4, and 6. 1, 2, 4, and 6 of number 455, and let's stand as we sing. Go out into the week with God's blessing as he blesses us. It says, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship and the power of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen. Amen.